You're watching Car Babble. I'm Ewan. And this is a Mercedes EQC fully electric SUV. And it's very fast. <laughs> Now, if you're shopping for a premium electric SUV, potentially also a used one, well, I'm going to try and answer the question in this video of whether or not this one should be on your shortlist. So if you enjoy my videos, don't forget to like and subscribe. There's a lot more coming up on the channel. Otherwise, buckle up and let's get into it. Now, EVs tend to have a reputation for being quicker than internal combustion engine cars, and the Mercedes EQC is no different. This is the 400 formatic AMG line. I'll talk more about specs later, but this has 760 newton meters of torque and 403 brake horsepower and it'll do not 60 in 5.1 seconds i'm in sport mode right now and if i put my foot down that is absolutely nuts nuts there is no need for this car to be this quick but it really isn't that fast for an ev it's such a refined experience as well it's so quiet in here it's an ev so you've not got a rattly diesel engine or anything going on in the background but it's very well noise insulated it's about noise from the tires but generally it just feels really quiet in here and it just feels like a sleeping giant you know it's just serene and relaxing and then all of a sudden you put your foot down and then oh yeah it's, it's a monster visibility is all right the back window is a little bit squished and the pillars are especially the B pillar is quite thick, but overall I wouldn't say visibility is too bad, wing mirrors are fine, so I'm not getting any major complaints there. Now this being the AMG line, it's uh, set up with sportier suspension and a lower stance, so you'd expect there to be a bit of a trade-off in terms of um, how it goes over bumps, and it is quite firm over bumps, especially at low speeds, you really do feel the imperfections, a bit less of an issue when you're going faster, but it is a bit fidgety, um, but body control is really quite well controlled and it handles quite well well actually when you're going around a corner fast and I wouldn't recommend you do too much of that because it is a two and a half ton car and it will not shift its weight as well as you would want it to on a country road to get the best thrills so I would temper that and enjoy your thrills on a straight line because you'll certainly get plenty of those steering wise is, is pretty good as well especially in sport mode it feels fairly responsive not massively so but it's uh, it's good enough now this car has an 80 kilowatt hour battery and it's paired to two electric motors on the each axle and you should get according to mercedes about 250 miles of ev range well according to my mate that owns this car that's a load of bollocks and if you're getting 200 in the summer you'll be doing all right and in the winter it'll go down from there to maybe about 160 165 which if you do a lot of winter driving and long distance driving that might leave you with a little bit of anxiety i'm just finding the experience of driving this pretty pretty enjoyable really i'm quite jealous of my friend for owning this thing it's um it really is quite a nice car to spend time in and you get quite a lot of looks as well people are really kind of eyeballing this thing you're like yeah that's my car no it's not actually it's my mates now let's talk about the looks of this car because this is essentially like a revamped electric version of the Mercedes GLC. But they've done just a few tweaks enough to let you know there's some differences and that it's obviously the electric one, like these little blue bits in the lights. And the grill's different. It is generally a slightly different looking car, but I really like the fact that they've got the balance right of making it stand out, but not making it too ridiculously futuristic that it just looks a bit weird and crap. So I really like the looks of this car and the grill. It's a different grill, but it's still a grill. You know, it's not just this big plastic bit that you get in some other EVs. And yeah, I really think that they've done a good job with this and it's just got a really mean stance from the front. Now I do like the side view of this car, but I do notice really that it doesn't ride very high as an SUV. It doesn't feels almost just like a car on stilts, so if I'm being honest. It's not got that presence like you could see really far ahead when you're driving, it just doesn't. But it's got 20 inch rims with the AMG line and you get these side soles as well, which look great, uh, but they're on the outside of the car and so they get dirty all the time. And when you get in and out of the car, your trousers are gonna get dirty. So that's something to bear in mind. But otherwise, yeah, I think it's really, really quite nice. And you know it's the electric one because it says EQC there. Now, I really like the back end as well. It's just got that bulky SUV look about it that I love. No fake exhaust pipes to replace ones that would otherwise have been there in the GLC. They're just gone like that, make it nice and clean. And importantly, the rear view camera, which is massively high resolution, absolutely brilliant. It's contained in here, so it lifts up when you reverse and therefore you never get it dirty, which is a solution that every car manufacturer by now should have thought of something for, but they haven't, not Mercedes. Now let's take a look in the boot of the EQC, which is electrically open by lifting up the star. 
And yeah, you've got 500 litres in here, which is not as big as some of its rivals, but still probably big enough for most small to medium sized families. And you've got 40, 20, 40 split folding seats. You've got space underneath here for your cables and no spare wheel annoyingly. A couple of tie down points and you've got a little netted area here to put some stuff in. And then if you want to put the seats down, just click this electric button and you've got 1060 litres. So it's a decent load bay, but it ain't the biggest. So back seat of the EQC and it is all right back here. Um, there's plenty of leg room. I'm 5'9 in seats in my driving position. But what I really like is this seat kind of recesses in. So you've got extra knee room almost. Like well, I think that really is quite a good design. So it's probably not as spacious back here as it maybe feels based on that. And headroom's all right and tow room's pretty good as well. So I think if you're under six foot, you'll have no problems back here, but over six foot, it's gonna start getting a bit cozy. It's a two seater back here as well, really. Three people abreast, not so much. This seat in the middle is soft and squidgy, just like the other two in the front, but it's raised up a bit and it's just not very wide. So if you had three people sitting abreast for a long period of time, they'd be like a tin of sardines. So that's not ideal. You've got these little pockets in the back of the seats, which feel a bit like airplane pockets. So they're kind of cool. And then you've got these door bins, which are plasticky, no, felt lining or anything but they're a decent size and connectivity you've got two usb-c's and a 12 volt a couple of air vents there and then this center armrest which is a lovely armrest so to speak and if you lift it up you've got this felt lined area to put stuff in as well which is great but why didn't they put the felt lining in the doors there that would have really helped quite a lot uh, and then these cup holders now if somebody could tell me what i'm doing wrong here with these i'd love to know because they seem really adaptive for your bottle um, but when you take your drink out, they just kind of clip back. Not really sure what that's all about, but it seems to be a bit over complicated as a design there. So please let me know if I'm doing that wrong and I'm being a complete muppet. Um, but yeah, that's about all there is to say. Ice effects on there are two seats and they're easy to get to. So that's good. Yeah, a couple of kids, people under six foot back here will be absolutely fine. Now, perceived quality in a Mercedes is always good. However, sometimes they get criticized for actual quality and build being a little bit lacking. I'm pleased to report that that's not the case in here. Nothing moves, everything's sold as a rock. Steering wheel feels really chunky. It's a bit hard actually, but it feels really expensive and the buttons feel nicely damped and there's just loads of them and they're easy to use. And yeah, touch points around the car, all very soft where you don't actually touch things, but elbow points, this one's really soft. This one's not as soft, but soft enough. The indicator stocks, high quality. You've also got the gear stock as an indicator stock, and I love that, because it just means you've got less clutter down here. I don't know why more cars don't do that. And the door close, that's high quality as well. My only issue with quality in here is, is really just this piano black in the center console. There's just so much of it. And even after trying to clean this, it still looks dirty for this review. It's just smudges and it just looks scratched all over. This car's two years old and it's scratched really bad. And I don't think the owner of this car does anything crazy with it. It's just piano black does not age well. And so Mercedes tend to use an awful lot of this. And I really, really wish they didn't because it cheapens this interior just a little bit as it ages. So that's annoying. But other than that, quality is excellent. Now, I would say storage is a strong point of this car. You've got this big central bin here, which has two USB ports. It's really deep and it's felt lined. So that's good. And then the center bit underneath this minimalist look is two cup holders, which are nice size they've got four teeth and they will hold a big bottle but they're not very deep um and then you've also got this area at the front where you can probably put your keys so that's good and the door bins themselves are really big and they've got these recesses for different sort of size bottles um so yeah they've, 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 they've got rubber mats on the bottom as well don't know why they couldn't have done that in the back but they are really quite good big decent sized door bins and then you've got a fairly big glove box as well so oh and uh, so, no that's the uh, sos button let's not press that Sunglasses holder, hallelujah. It's good to see one of those as well. Most cars these days don't seem to do them, but yeah, storage is decent. Now the centerpiece of this car is this infotainment system, this massive long infotainment system. So you've got this 10.25 inch touchscreen here, and then you've got your 10.25 inch digital cockpit here. And the colors are, are so clear and bright and, and just vibrant. And everything about it just feels like really, really modern software. That's the MBUX platform, which is one of Mercedes' newest bits of kit. And it really does feel very, very cool and techy and just ace. The touchscreen itself isn't particularly laggy when you swipe about and when you press buttons. The buttons are quite big in places, not that difficult to hit. Just feels quite responsive. But you can also use it in different ways. You can use the side of the steering wheel for the touchscreen, and you can use this little black button to swipe about and press buttons. So there are good shortcuts available from your steering wheel. I love that. 
and then the right side, same again for using your digital cockpit. And that's really customizable in the way it looks. You can have different gauges and dials and make it look different. So it does look really, really fancy. And then you've got the center console, which other than the piano black, you've got shortcut buttons for your AC controls and you can just do all of that there. Thank you very much, Mercedes, for not burying them in a touch screen. So that's good. You've got other shortcut buttons and you've got this little trackpad that you can use for swiping about and for also for input destinations and things, really good. You've also got your drive mode selector button, a nice little easy switch to press on the move. Everything feels very, very intuitive and simple, although I do think this infotainment system is gonna take a little bit more of a learning curve than a BMW's iDrive, but once you get it, it's really good. One thing though that bothers me is I feel like this center console and the infotainment display, it's not driver focused. It actually feels more like it's facing to the passenger, the center console, and even like when I look at my cockpit, yeah, that looks square on, but when I look at the main infotainment screen, it just feels like it's it's so far away and it's almost facing more to the passenger. I don't know what they were doing there, but it doesn't feel, I'd much rather a curved screen or something that feels a bit more driver centric. And in a BMW, you definitely get that. And that's something that bothers me a little bit. They did it with the air vents, they face me, but the rest of it doesn't really face me. So I don't feel like it's a very engaging cockpit in that regard. However, there's something that this car has that I've heard other Mercedes is to be a culprit for, and it's offset pedals. This accelerator pedal is quite far to the right, and I've driven a car with offset pedals in the past, and I did get a bad back from it, and I already have a bad back, but I felt quite twisted and just not very square on, and that is quite far to the right there, so I could see over time if I was driving this long distances, that would bother me. So I would really think about that if you've got back problems because that could be a deal breaker for some people. So the base spec of this car is pretty well equipped. It's a sport model and you get 19 inch alloy wheels, privacy glass, blind spot monitoring, lane keep assist, active brake assist, a rear facing camera, LED headlights, keyless entry, which I always think a premium car should have in its base model, but it doesn't always. So it's quite well spec'd. And then if you go up the AMG line, you get 20 inch wheels and more sporty touches, which is what this car is and then you've got to go up to the AMG line premium to get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and a few other things. And then if you go up to premium plus, that's where you get like all the good stuff, the top stereo, the Burmester sound system, you get a pan roof and other things as well. Adaptive cruise control though, is always an option no matter what. And I just think that sucks. I mean, I don't understand why German premium car makers seem to think that adaptive cruise is like the holy grail of options that always has to be an option, even if you've got the top spec of everything else. That really annoys me. But yeah, you have to still option that to get it. Otherwise you've got cruise control, which seems to work pretty well. And you've got that across the range at least. This car also has a five star Euro NCAP safety rating. So you can take comfort in knowing it's a pretty safe car for your family. Reliability wise, it's now in 2023 becoming a more main midstream kind of reliability ranked car. But when it first came out, it wasn't the best. So they've obviously made changes over time to make it better. But if you were buying one of these as a used car from a couple of years ago, that's something to bear in mind. And then servicing costs, always high with Mercedes, but you get a three year warranty and which is nothing special, but it's unlimited miles, which is better than some of its competitors. So that's worth noting. Now, this is a very expensive car. This brand new is over 70 grand. And if you go, and that's just the base spec, if you go for the top spec, it's over 80 grand. Interestingly though, I don't think you can buy the top spec at the moment. I believe there must be some supply chain issues with Mercedes because you go online to buy it, not that I'm trying to buy it, but just to see the price and it's not there. You can only get the AMG line. So I'm guessing they've got some semiconductor issue or something at the moment. And therefore, if you wanted a top spec one, you're gonna have to buy a used one. And I think that's maybe where it becomes more palatable for most people because one that's a couple of years old with like 30 to 40,000, the clock's gonna be between 40 and 50 grand. And that feels a bit more realistic and more, yeah, right for the kind of car this is. When you compare it to its rivals, like the BMW iX3, Volvo XC40 EV, the Jaguar I-Pace, the Tesla Model Y, the Audi e-tron, some of them are priced lower than this and some of them will do more things. They'll have bigger boots, they'll be more practical, they'll have more performance if that's remotely necessary. So this feels as a new car, blooming expensive. And really, yeah, it's quite a special occasion being in here, but outside of that, it's not technically any better than its rivals. So it's very expensive new. So I think as a used buy, that might be the way to go. So hope you enjoyed the video guys. And if you did, don't forget to give it a like and consider subscribing because there's a lot more coming up on the channel. I'm just getting started and I'd love to know your thoughts on this car and my critique of it. So please do leave me a comment below. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.